Now, before we open up the scriptures, let us recite this ancient prayer together. Uh, this is the benediction over the word. You can say it with me. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has given us the word of truth and has planted everlasting life in our midst. Blessed are you, O Lord, who gives the scriptures. Amen. Let us open now our Bibles to the book of Habakkuk. You know, this portion of scripture brings out a formidable conversation between a man and God. Let us resume what we have covered so far. Here we find a man, Habakkuk, who was so affected by the evil he witnessed, but so was God, who is even now so disturbed by it. And so in the text, we find them both hurt and wounded to, to see such decadence and such lawlessness. And as Habakkuk witnessed the growing pains of the people in his society and the increased prosperity of the wicked at the expense of truth and, and justice, he complains to God, and there God answers him. However, God's response went beyond Habakkuk's local problems. And this is where he shows him how he will deal with evil in general and eventually and soon put a complete stop to it. This is when the Lord gives Habakkuk a powerful vision of the future judgment of evil. And there the prophet not only learns that acts of lawlessness were not to be left unpunished, none of them in fact, but he was so taken by the vision where he saw another aspect of evil, even the core of rebellion. That is, first and foremost, evil is against God. That sin and evil is first against him. This affected him even more. And this is where we begin to see the true heart of a prophet. This is where he somehow abruptly, as he interrupted God, says what we read in verse 12. Are you not from everlasting Jehovah my God? My Holy One, we shall not die. You are of purer eyes than to behold evil and cannot look on wickedness. See again how he spoke of God, my Holy One, Jehovah, my God. This is an outburst of love and deep respect for God. After all, Habakkuk was most likely a priest at the temple, and he experienced God's holiness in all the very complicated ritual he needed actually to observe. He saw how it was almost impossible for anyone to enter the Holy of Holies, where the presence of God rested, except the high priests, and only once a year, and only under very difficult conditions. And here in the vision, he saw the defiance. The laughter to those creatures, men and fallen angels, challenging the God of Israel. But Habakkuk, I want to tell you, is not the only one who shows such deep love and respect for God. Many more have had the same realization of evil and the same reaction when God's holiness was mistreated. Do you remember David, the young David? When he, he, he challenged death because he was so hurt for God. When the armies of the Philistines produced a giant, Goliath, who instilled fear in all the people of Israel, David stood and asked, he says, for who is this impure Philistine that he should taunt the, the armies of the living God? The word taunt, haraf, in Hebrew means to treat with contempt to score, to count as little worth, for this is what sin and evil do. That was David's way to say, how can you taunt my Holy One, my Lord and God? This is a verse we have to memorize. For no enemy can prevail against us when the Lord of hosts is on our side, right? And so the size of the arrogance and this insignificant, of this insignificant giant Goliath did not face David at all. He took a little stone and he actually killed him with this. Just like that small stone that destroyed the big statue that represented the world kingdoms that we find in Daniel 2. By the way, I want to tell you that Goliath 
came out of the same territory as where Hamas is now today. What is striking is that it seems that the size of the territory, actually, if you compare the maps, is exactly the same almost. And so Habakkuk's reaction is also very much like the response we find in David's later on in the book of Psalm. For instance, in Psalm 139, where he spoke so highly of God, and then at the end, he wrote actually these surprising words. Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O oh God. Depart from me, therefore, men of bloodshed, for they speak against you wickedly, and your enemies take your name in vain. Why this sudden change in this psalm? Have you ever realized? David was so wounded for God's holiness that he prayed that these insults and affronts against our God were stopped. This, of course, had reached a point of no return in their wickedness, and therefore David's prayers was not to uplift them, but to recognize, so that they would recognize the evil and their own inability. These were enemies of another sort. They were the ones who grieved God deeply and needed judgment to be brought against them, and right away. And if Habakkuk was grieved, so is God grieved even today. Now, this is important. Now, the reasons behind the judgment to come that will bring God to judge the evil in the near future are the same as the, one, as the grievance he had of the judgment of the flood. He said in Genesis 6, 14, the Lord was sorry that he made man on earth and he was grieved in his heart. This is the same grievance we are about to see in the prophecies of Habakkuk as God is going to speak. Remembering that Yeshua said that the coming of the Son of Man will be just like in the days of Noah. The coming of the Son of Man is the one that Habakkuk also saw in a most wonderful way in chapter 3 later on. And so in the next verses, and in God's second answer to this chapter, we will learn much more about God's love and holiness and how low evil could bring down defiant creatures, men and fallen angels. And we will also learn how we, ourselves, ought to act when evil is increasing around us. The following chapter of Habakkuk will turn out to be one of the most practical texts for us in preparation for the end times, in preparation for meeting God, for meeting Yeshua at the rapture. It will tell us how to be well prepared to meet him. Now let us first look at some of the choice words that Habakkuk used in this section as he speaks to God. First, there's something about our Bible translation we can learn here. Originally, it was the Jewish scribes or the Sophirim who transcribes the scriptures and were also filled with great respect for God. They were very careful that, so that every letter, every stroke was reproduced as given. It is specifically to them that the oracles were trusted, as Paul said in Romans chapter 3, verse 2. However, on this part of the Bible, they actually went overboard. See the words in verse 12, translated into English, We shall not die. Lo namut. The original text, however, should read, You shall not die. Lo tamut, speaking of God. But this suffering, suffering that is wanting to preserve God's holiness and wanting to maintain, as they saw, a more respectful way of addressing God, actually changed the Hebrew to lo namut, so that it would read, We shall not die. Instead of saying, You, Lord, shall not die. They changed the you for the we. And this is not a case where they changed it secretly. They did, they did it, and they advertised it. So this modification is sparked, by the way, I don't know if you know, there are 18 amendations or changes of the soferim called tikkun soferim done in our Bible, all done to preserve, according to them, a great respect for God. That, of course, doesn't make it right. No one should change anything in the Word of God, right? Only a few translations bring out the, the right reading, like the NIV or the BBE, which stands for the Bible in basic English. The other 17 changes do not affect much of the text. The first, by the way, the first of these changes in, is found in Genesis 18.22, to give you a, an idea, where it says that Abraham was still standing before God. 
The original text says that it was the Lord who was standing before Abraham. But this did not sound right to the Sopharim, so that, that the Lord should stand near next to Abraham. So they changed it around. Another is Psalm 106.20, where we read, Thus they exchanged their glory for the image of an ox that eats grass. The original text actually said that it was not man's glory, but God's glory that was changed. For them, it's, well, it was not proper to speak of God's glory this way. We should uh, consider this as an overreaction from the scribes. The word, again, should not be altered in any way. It should be left as is, even if we don't understand it. As for Habakkuk, when he spoke to God and he says, you will not die, he was affirming his eternity and was outraged that some would consider the Lord was as temporal, as limited. And as we have noticed before, as one reads on Habakkuk's words and later God's answer, the whole text seems to be focusing on one particular individual more than one nation. This is important because in any story, one needs to identify who the players are. Who then is the prophecy about? It begins in verse 12 again, where Habakkuk says, You have ordered him for judgment, O rock, and have appointed him for correction. It's in singular, by the way. And in the next verse 13, Habakkuk calls them the wicked, who are uh, why are you silent when the wicked swallows up those more righteous than they? First, whoever the end is, this individual is, what we see one more time in verse, as in verse 12 is God's sovereignty, right? He ordained him. He appointed him. No empire or individual rises without God's consent. And when anyone does rise, there is a very specific or special reason for it. But who is this individual here? And throughout the text, the rest, throughout the rest of the prophecy referring to. Some, like the rabbis, thought that he's an individual, perhaps a Babylonian king, Nebuchadnezzar, or his grandson, Belshazzar. Though they were very cruel and brutal, the Babylonians had a soft side, which we do not see in the way this individual, the, the utter evil of this individual, is described in the rest of Habakkuk. For instance, the Jews were very well treated when they in captivity in Babylon. God even told them to pray for the city they were living in. He said, seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into the exile and pray the Lord on, on its behalf. And furthermore, Nebuchadnezzar has had some affection for Jeremiah and also for Daniel. He gave orders to his commanders to treat Jeremiah well. He even allowed him to come to Babylon three times to travel to Babylon and back to Israel. As for Daniel, he was very much appreciated by Nebuchadnezzar to the point that he reached a very high position in Babylon. And furthermore, at times Nebuchadnezzar did speak so highly of God. In fact, you know that some even believe, some modern commentators believe that he's a believer in the God of the Bible. One doesn't get any of this type of character when reading Habakkuk's prophecies concerning this one individual. This is another reason why we know that Habakkuk's words are prophetic. They speak of someone else. And so what follows in his words and in God's second response is a denunciation of this evil that is about to come over this world and of this evil individual that is coming and can be identified as the Antichrist. Beginning with verse 14, as Habakkuk was looking at the growth of his kingdom to come over the earth, he is amazed at his power. He says, and you make man as the fish of the sea, as the creeping things that have no ruler over them, and takes up all of them with a hook and catches them in his net and gathers them into his drag. Therefore, he rejoices and is glad. Therefore... He sacrifices unto his net. You know, this part of the prophecy is like a synopsis of the description of the Antichrist kingdom, similar to the one we have in Revelation, beginning of Revelation 13, where we see the rise of the Antichrist. First and again, Habakkuk reminds us of God's sovereignty. He, the Lord, makes man as the fish of the sea. He regulates all details and aspects of evil. 
Here the nation, the men are seen as the fish of the sea ready to be trapped by some fishermen. They had no idea of his presence. And so the Talmud, by the way, has an interesting interpretation of this verse. Perhaps they were influenced by the verse that we find in chapter 2, verse 14, where we read, For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of Jehovah as the waters cover the sea. This is when Jesus comes back. And so they ask the question, and I quote, Why are the people compared with the fish of the sea? To tell you the following, just as the fish that live in the sea die immediately if they come out and to dry land, so too people die immediately if they depart from the words of the Bible and from the fulfillment of the commandments. You know, at the end, this is precisely why Israel and the nations will find themselves at the mercy of such evil because they have forsaken the Creator and His Word. Amos, the prophet, describes this day when the individual will be taken over as a famine of the Word of God. Have you read Amos 8.11 describing the tribulation times, he says, Behold, these are coming, declares the Lord God, when I will send a famine on the land, not a famine for bread or a thirst for water, but rather for hearing the words of God. And this is why we need to proclaim it. We need to say it. People need to hear it. Not hearing the word of God is not seeing God at all because God re actually comes into the word of God and, re and declares his character. And there is something else in these verses 15, 7 to 17 that one more time reveals to us the great spiritual war and aspect of this battle. Here as the aggressors is compared to the aggressor that is in singular is compared to a fisherman who gathers the nation for destruction, there is a word that is repeated five times in these three verses, the word net. Three of the times it, it, it translates the Hebrew word cherem, which is also the word for curse. In verse 15, he drags them with his net, with his curse. He offers sacrifices to his net, to his curse, verse 16. He empties his curse, his net, continually on the nations, verse 17. But see how this curse, this net, is his personified, for we read that he offers sacrifices to his net. What is this net? Who is this net, this curse? It is a higher power that the Antichrist actually worships. And who is this power that gives the Antichrist energy and strength? In Revelation 13, this is where we have the answer. In Revelation 13, he's called the drakon in Greek, where we get our word dragon. And to whom worship is offered by the Antichrist and the false prophet. It is this dracon who gives power and authority to the Antichrist. Dragon is another name for a serpent in secular Greek. And in fact, this is how he is identified in Revelation 20 verse 2. When he is caught and confined, there it says, And he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. He is the Gog in the prophecy of Gog and Magog. It is him to him who the Lord speaks throughout Ezekiel 38 and 39. It is with him that evil originates. And Habakkuk, like John, tells us that this individual will bring the world actually to worship him. The other word for net used here is also significant. It is used in verse 15 and 16, translated fishing net. Here also it is personified as the individual burns incense to this curse. The word here, the net, is mikmeret. It is a big fishing net. <clears throat> Perhaps the forces of evil thought that they had victory over the nations and over the creation of God and began to throw their nets for destruction. Perhaps they were aware of the last of the seven parables of the kingdom of Jesus. It is the parable of the dragnet, where at the end, a large dragnet is cast into the sea, and this net gathers every kind of fish. And there the angel will separate the wicked from the righteous, Jesus says. It is the same word in Greek for net, which is used in Matthew in the New Testament, and in the Septuagint in the Greek translation of Habakkuk. 
Let us remember that evil always imitates the good. But of course, this gathering of fish will be interrupted by the second coming. And it is after witnessing these things that Habakkuk rests his case. And then he fully relies on God. It is at this point where the text in Habakkuk becomes so practical as our dealing with evil and wickedness. How long would it be, right? He asked at the beginning, the answer is right here. Again, this is a very precious part of the scriptures. Let us begin to see Habakkuk's next move after observing the utter evil of this world and seeing how God is so involved with us. His reaction opens up chapter 2. This is his first conclusion. <clears throat> I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will keep watch to see what, will, I will, what he will say unto me and while I shall answer to my reproof. Four things. I will stand. I will set myself on a tower. I will keep watch. I will be ready to answer. But isn't this the task of every believer today as God asks us in chapter 1 verse 5? Look, observe. And so Habakkuk pre prepares to do just that. On top of a tower. I will stand on my watch. That was Habakkuk's decision. The word stand, ramad, is where we get the word ramda. That is meaning a pillar. He would not change. He will wait. This is when Habakkuk night decides to resume his work as a priest and keep watch. That is zafa, meaning I will look. I'm going to observe like God asked. And what does a watchman do? He warns. He informs. He alerts. But are we not in a very similar position as Habakkuk? We have also been given this vision of the future, at least part of it for now in this part of Habakkuk. In Yeshua's word, you are the light of the world. But see what he adds to this great work. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor does anyone lamp light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. It makes no sense to have a nice and bright lamp in a dark room and chose to hide it under a basket or under the bed or wherever. In the same way, it makes no sense to have such great prophecies that we have in the scripture, such great revelation from God and not share them. Yeshua says after that, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify the Father in heaven. That is basically what Habakkuk decided to do. He went back to his watch stop, a high tower, the Hebrew Mizmeret. This word is used frequently in relation to the priestly sacred works at the temple. It is often translated by the words duty, charge. And when the Lord tells the priest, you shall keep charge, my Mizmeret. They were to do that for they were the priests representing God to the people and so is the believer today. We are priests representing the Lord and his anointed one, the Messiah to this world. And it is at this point where the Lord speaks again and furthers the vision. The previous vision was only introduction. The next one is much more powerful. Again, he keeps the best one for the end. And so in preparation for the next phase of the vision, the Lord begins to further encourage Habakkuk to be this watchman. Look at verse 3 and 4. Then the Lord answered me and said, Record the vision and inscribe it on tablets, that the one who reads it may run. For the vision is yet for the appointed time. It's a, it hastens toward the goal, and it will not fail. Though it tarries, wait for it. For it will certainly come. It will not delay. It is at this point where the priest turns prophet and asks to write down, he was asked to write down the prophecy. This is why we have it today. We are not told what the vision is that he wrote, 
and what, or what part of the vision, but it is probably the one that is revealed for us in chapter 3, where we are given the mighty description of the coming of the Lord. And so God asks Habakkuk to engrave the vision on the tablet. Same word used for the tablet where the Ten Commandments were written, perhaps to enhance the importance of the message. What's more, the word tablet is preceded by the definite article, the tablet. Perhaps he took time for Habakkuk to chisel them, but they were known to both God and the prophet. And every word, I want to tell you, is special in the verse, as you read it in Hebrew. The word write or record, becher, is not the usual word for writing. It only occurs three times in the Hebrew scriptures. All this to reveal an important moment. The two other places we see this word are in the Torah, in Deuteronomy, where Moses expounded the law. In Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 5. And then at the end of Deuteronomy chapter 28, when Moses asked the Israelites to write on the stones of the words of this law. Very clearly, he says. And if this word is used right here in Habakkuk, we can see the importance of the vision that is about to receive again. And Habakkuk did even more, by the way. He turned the most important part of the prophecy, the coming of the Messiah, into a song. I must have sang it in, to, in the temple, that is. This is the song we're about to learn as well, or at least its word, because we don't know the melody, right? And see how the Lord tells Habakkuk to record the vision so that the one who reads may also run. That is, once you read it and understand it, you out to say like Amos the prophet, the Lord has spoken, who can but prophesy? And the one who proclaims it is called to run, as if the vision would soon be realized. And for the people of Israel, by the way, at that time, it was actually soon to be realized because the Babylonians were at the door, or at least they weren't even uh, actually created, but they were coming. Within a few years, they would be at the door. And we can see the double reference of the prophecy and how close we are today for the fulfillment of these events. Let me ask you something then. How much should, it be, should we be running for the word of God? Furthermore, have you noticed the similarities with the prophets as with the writers of the letters of the Brit Hadasha, that is the New Testament? Do you see how in the New Testament they're all in a hurry, right? As if... The world was to end on the same day, right? Paul was always running. I don't know if he ever rested, really. Most of them surely knew it was not going to end right there. But what could have ended on the same day was the life of anyone living and a lost soul. They all knew was a most tragic loss. That's why they were in a hurry. People die every day, and this is where we can find a cause for their sense of haste and for our needed sense also of haste. Like the Spirit who inspired the words in Psalm 93 and Hebrews 4 when saying, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Today, not tomorrow, for you don't know what tomorrow will bring. And so we are asked to run and to tell the people. If you do not know who Yeshua is, and today you feel that the Lord is talking to you, by the way. And you hear him when he does. You will recognize him. Then accept him as your personal savior. Time is running. And this will start you on a new journey of hope and answers. And it will unleash the best ever blessing you can ever experience if you don't know Yeshua yet. Concerning the word run... There's one more interpretation, by the way. One said that the message should be so clearly written and in such big letters that even if someone were to run by it, he would be able to read it. Actually, I like that. It's good. In any case, the idea is that it should be told and it should be proclaimed. And it is in the next verse where we are told and taught how to wait. Have you ever resolved this dichotomy between the imminent coming of the Lord and the long time he's taking? Right? This verse will help you to make sense of this. Look at verse 3. This is God speaking. 
For the vision is yet for an appointed time. It hastens towards the goal and it will not fail. Though it tarries, wait for it. For it will certainly come. It will not delay. One thing we can say is that the Spirit actually really understands our impatience and our frustrations. Notice these many words. There are seven sayings here, really. His coming is so sure that it has been appointed, appointed times. It is going towards a goal, right? And the word is moed, like the appointed times for the Feast of Israel. So every prophecy has an appointed time, and it has a goal. And yes, it tarries. God recognizes that. But wait for it, he says. It will not delay. Furthermore, be sure it will not fail. It will certainly come. Some have seen a contradiction here. It says it will not delay, and it also says it will tarry. But what it says is that it may come today or tomorrow, in 25 years, in 50 years. That is the nature of prophecy. The idea is to learn to wait and grow strong and long for the coming of the Lord. After all, we'll all meet the Lord. Did you know that? This is a great assurance of the scriptures. We will all meet the Lord physically and very soon. And you know what? When I realize that, I'd like to have a little more time to prepare myself. Right? In fact, this is what the word hastens conveys in Hebrew. As far as the longing, this longing, this nostalgia that we have of a better world. Nostalgia of wanting to meet what is right, what is justice. The word hasten is poor, meaning to breathe or to blow. But this word also means to long. As in Psalm 12, 5. Where the Lord answers a question concerning the delays during the tribulation. And he tells us that he himself longs as well to meet us physically. He says, because of the devastation of the afflicted, because of the groaning of the needy, now I will arise, says Jehovah, and I will set him in the safety for which he longs. This is what the Lord does. He will put hope into the heart so that we also may long with him. And this longing also emphasizes by another prophet. Look at Isaiah 30, verse 18. It says, therefore, the Lord longs, this is where we see it, to be gracious to you. And therefore, he waits on high to have compassion on you. And so this is how we ought to wait, with a great longing, knowing that the prophecy is sure and will come, and it will not delay. Among the words found in verse 3, there's a yet another word translated, the word yet in the vision. When it says, the vision is yet to be appointed. This is an important word. It's small, but important. The word is rod in Hebrew. Translated elsewhere with words like longer still. It has the same root as the meaning to testify, to witness. For in many ways, prophecies also testifies of our longing and belief and faith in his word. This will be expounded a little later. There is one, did you know that there is one crown given and for those who will be given to those who actually are expecting the coming of the Lord? This is found in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8, where Paul says in the future, There is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also on all who have loved his appearing. The word crown, Stephanos. There are a few crowns prepared for God for the workers in heaven. This is a great one, by the way. One of them, actually, this one that is, is for longing for his appearing. These are those, again, who love prophecy. And like those men and women believers in the Hebrew scriptures mentioned in Hebrews 11, they all had this common denominator, this common longing for what? For heaven. For the city that God had prepared for them. Have you been longing for this moment? This is, I want to tell you, a purifying and even therapeutic aspect found in the scriptures. John said, 1 John 3, 3, and everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. The hope of his coming is not simple wish. It is a certainty that is what hope 
in the Bible tells us. However, it is in the next verse where the Lord is about to declare a great tool we must all use to enforce our patience and our proclamation. That tool is faith. One word, faith. The, again, this is the common denominator of all the believers in the Hebrew Scriptures, as we see in Hebrews 11. This part we'll see together in our next study. Let us conclude with this one word that Habakkuk used at the beginning when he said to God in verse 12, Are you not from Kedem? Kedem, remember? Everlasting. We've seen that the word everlasting is Kedem in Hebrew, which means, which is translated so many times as east. But this is from where the Lord comes, where he is and where he originally wanted to be and dwell with man. You know, the first time that this word is mentioned is in Genesis chapter 2, verse 8. It says that the Lord God planted a garden toward the east, Kedem, in Eden, Eden, and there he placed the man whom he had formed. He actually planned to live with him there. And then after that Adam and Eve sin, we meet these words in Genesis 3, 24. I'll just read them to you. He says, so he drove men out. And at the east of the Garden of Eden, he stationed a cherubim with a flaming sword so that they cannot come back there. And since then, the doors of paradise have been closed. But the Messiah, Jesus, Yeshua, came and opened it one more time and forever for those who come to him. They will come in and be restored for eternity. And so we can repeat these words from the Psalms and from the book of Hebrews. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Today again, not tomorrow, for we do not know what tomorrow will bring. And the only way to do that is to accept Yeshua as your personal Savior if you don't know him. Recognize that he is the only way to God. So he can impart on you great blessing in this life. And also a great gift of eternal life. Amen? Amen. Let us bow our head in prayer. Let us give praise to God on high. He is blessed and is to be blessed. For no one is like you, for you are great in holiness and doing wonderful things. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, and the God of our fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and Jacob, the God who is great, powerful, and renew, revered. The God most high, the Lord of heaven and earth, our shield and the shield of our fathers. Blessed are you, O Lord, for you are the shield of Abraham, and you are the shield of everyone who humbly comes to you with a repentant heart. Today, Lord, we've seen how the action of some disturb you, but there again, you are so loving, so patient, not wanting that anyone should perish. For all these things, Lord, we praise you and we thank you that you revealed your feelings and emotions to us, your creation. Bless each and everyone present here and each and everyone who is listening to this prayer. Put your healing hand upon those who are sick, and who are looking to you for healing, for renewal of their souls, and especially for the eternal salvation we have in Yeshua. Rest your salvation, Lord, on those who desire it. And to the congregation, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord makes his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. Amen and amen. Amen.